Okay, for this final video for this section, we're going to hopefully wrap everything up. And um, I think this topic can be uh, interesting, but uh, sometimes a little difficult for some folks to understand. So we're going to be speaking about lake stratification, turnover. Um, we're going to discuss some killer lakes, even a uh, mythological story from the Bible. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, cool stuff in this video related to... Um, to uh, lake turnover. So we're going to switch over. Um, so the last time, the last video, we were talking about eutrophication and the impacts of eutrophication can make the effects of turnover all the greater. So getting at lake turnover. Before we start talking about how lakes turn over and people who do fishing and that kind of stuff may be very interested in lake turnover, they've heard fishermen uh, talk about it. Um, we first have to understand the three major layers in a stratified lake. And I'm talking about a stratified lake um, for like most of the lakes in this part of the, of the world. And uh, some lakes in this part of the world do this in the summertime and get messy. Kind of it all blends together in the spring and the fall when temperatures change. Some lakes in the world don't do this very often at all. They, they, they stratify one time and never mix or rarely mix. And we'll talk about those here in a little bit. So the three layers, we have the epilimnion, metalimnion, and hypolimnion. So the word limnion comes from limnos. Uh, there's a uh, academic discipline called limnology. So uh, some schools offer senior level and graduate level classes in limnology if you're in environmental science, which is largely the study of freshwater as well as sometimes they include uh, estuaries as well. But uh, it's largely the study of lakes, rivers, and streams, and ponds. That's limnology. So the layers. We have the epilimnion. So epi, like epidermis, like what's on or among or around. So the, the top layer is the epilimnion. Metalimnion refers to probably like the middle. And then hypo means below. Think of somebody with hypothermia. You know, if they fall into a very, very cold water, they may get hypothermia. Their body temperature goes below what it's needed for survival. So that's where the word hypo meaning low, below. So hypolimnion is the bottom. Metalimnion is the middle, and the epilimnion is the outside, which is the uh, top water, top of the water. Another name for the metalimnion, and it's a zone right here, is the thermocline. Thermo meaning temperature, cline meaning change. There's an instrument that people use in geology called a clinometer that measures the slope, so it measures the change, so thermocline, so it's the temperature change zone, so this is the thermocline, so the epilimnion, fairly stable temperatures, hypolimnion in a stratified lake, fairly steady temperature, just a little colder, and this, as we go down from the top, this layer here, the metalimnion is the thermocline. So those are the three major stratification zones. Now, this is fascinating about water. Water has a unique property that allows it to sink or float based upon the temperature. So the density of water is, is fascinating. Most people, you might think that these numbers should be set at like zero and 100 degrees or some round number. But no, water is most dense at four degrees Celsius. So what does this statement mean? Water is the heaviest at four degrees Celsius. So what's four degrees Celsius for our US friends here, right? We think, uh, we think, we know that four degrees Celsius is about 39 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you know a little bit about water and freezing and you remember chemistry or, or basic physical science, uh, maybe from high school or middle school or earlier, 
four degrees Celsius and zero, zero is um, in Celsius, and then we start getting around 32 degrees Fahrenheit, 33 degrees Fahrenheit, you'll start seeing freezing starting to occur. So zero degrees Celsius is freezing. Water is heaviest at four degrees. So when the entire lake temperature is about the same, it'll be 39 degrees Fahrenheit and mixing can occur. We'll talk about that here in a second. And when that mixing occurs, when all the water is the same, nutrients can be resuspended. And this is when the lake from the top to the bottom is all the same temperature and all the nutrients can get in the water. Not only can it fuel algae blooms and water quality problems, if this rarely happens, if this mixing happens like once every 100 years or maybe 20 or 50 years in a nutrient-rich lake, a lot of the toxic gases at low levels aren't toxic, but when turnover happens every 50 to 100 years, there's so much that it can be called killer lakes. They can actually kill people and kill animals. So we'll talk about that in a second. But we need to talk about water being most dense at four degrees Celsius. So we have to think of our, our lake, the top of the lake. And let's think about when it's getting cold outside. Let's think about the fall. As the temperature starts to get colder and colder and colder, the outside of the lake, the upper layer, it will start to get colder. And as it gets closer to four degrees Celsius on the surface, the four degrees Celsius water will sink and sink and sink. And when it's four degrees Celsius, it, it'll, as it's sinking, that water may start to warm up to the rest of the lake temperature. But overall, as the whole lake gets colder and colder and colder and colder, the whole lake, the surface water will all sink to the bottom. And then as it sinks to the bottom, it's getting more and more of the lake will become about the same temperature. So then that allows the mixing to occur. Could you imagine if water was most dense at zero degrees Celsius? Could you imagine that? So at zero degrees Celsius, what does water look like? Is it liquid? At zero degrees Celsius or 32 degrees, 33 degrees Fahrenheit, water's ice. And as the water gets colder, if it's zero degrees Celsius and that's when it's the heaviest, or as it gets colder, it gets heavier and heavier and heavier, like maybe you think like a rock or something, so it gets colder and colder and colder. If it was ice, the ice would sink. And then as the ice sinks, more ice would sink and more and more. And eventually the whole lake would freeze from the bottom up. That would be catastrophic for fish and other types of aquatic life. So we're really privileged that, it's, I mean, humans probably would have never come to be, at least in the freshwater temperate landscape that most Americans live in, where we have lakes and rivers, human life wouldn't be able to survive if the lakes froze from the top and then that went to the bottom and then they eventually froze up from the bottom. If lakes froze from the bottom up, our lakes and rivers and streams would be dead or things would have had to adapt to survive being frozen. So we've got a really good situation that when things freeze at the top, first the heavy water will sink to the bottom and become four degrees Celsius, but then as that water gets colder and colder and colder from the bottom up, the ice will start forming and then at zero degrees Celsius or cooler, stuff will end up freezing and we'll have that nice ice barrier and then life can continue below the ice. So there's a video that this has got some problems. I'm gonna to switch to it, this lake turnover video, but this kind of shows how this works. So you've got your three zones, epilimnion, thermocline, and hypolimnion. And then the cold water starts pushing down. And then this water is warmer and it will start moving up as the cold water. So it'll show it continuing to move. Now right here, it says cold warm. Cold and warm water will not cross paths and then just keep continuing. There'll be some sort of mixing that will happen. 
And as it mixes, this up becomes temperature. Pretty good job. And this, so it is when stratification, those zones that we remember from before, stratification, it is when these zones no longer look like this, and this thermal profile straightens out a little bit more, and there are no stratification or strata. This is all one mixed layer. And during this time, nutrients can be resuspended and phosphorus can come up from the bottom. It may have been trapped down there and maybe even other types of nutrients will be trapped in the sediments. They can come up and become available. So there are different types of lakes. Um, we have our oligotrophic lakes that have their own type of stratification. And we also have eutrophic lakes that have their type of stratification. We've got eutrophic lakes mostly in Kentucky. So turnover, the temperature is all the same, the dissolved oxygen profile is the same during the turnover event. Same thing is true during fall when the lakes are changing temperatures. Now, when we're stratified in the summer, We've got these nice boundary layers. As we have the top, this is our epilimnion, thermocline, hypolimnion. And we also see epilimnions where we've got photosynthesis that can occur. So during the daytime, we'll have high dissolved oxygen levels. Thermocline, we'll have some dissolved oxygen levels. But as the temperature goes down and sunlight goes down, there's less and less oxygen. And then by the time we're not even maybe 20 or 10 meters down in a eutrophic lake, 20, 30 feet down, sometimes even less than that. It's so dark because all the photosynthetic activity up here and all the plant life blocking all the light, it gets cold, but it's also stratified. And there's no way to produce oxygen down here. There's no photosynthesis. We're below the photic zone for these turbid lakes. So there's no oxygen. There's no sense in fishing 20 and 30 feet down in a eutrophic lake um, in, in places like Lake Reba during the summertime. Nothing can live at the bottom of that lake because there's no oxygen. The only thing that can live down there are anaerobic microorganisms. Whereas in an oligotrophic lake, down deep in the water, the water stays uh, cold enough and there's sunlight that can penetrate a good ways down, they can maintain dissolved oxygen levels pretty far down. So that's just a little bit about summer stratification. During the winter, when you have ice, uh, things change a little bit, um, but we won't spend too much time on that. So in general, um, we like to uh, make sure that our water plants are drawing their water, especially in eutrophic lakes, from this layer right about there, hypolimnion zone. We don't want to be too close to the bottom that we take stuff up off the bottom, but we want to be below the photic zone. We want to have no plant life um, or plankton and that results in less clogging of the intake screens. And also um, when we treat the water, if we're treating it with chlorine or some other things like ozone even, the chlorine will have less things to interact with. So we'll have less disinfection byproducts if we're below that um, kind of biological activity zone that you get on the surface, or if you're not totally on the very bottom of the lake, so we'll get less disinfection byproducts. Now, that's all on the stratification. Um, and the last little clip here, or maybe I'll uh, pull up another video just for your own kind of uh, curiosity sake. Um, there's some cool stuff on uh, spooky geology, Lake Neos, um, where we've talked about lake turnover happening periodically throughout history. Um, we've got these killer lakes. Some of them have even been implicated as being part of the plague 
uh, that killed the firstborn children. So I'm going to cover that here in the next video along with a review.